A few episodes ago, we started working with compute shaders for constructing the grid frustums and light culling. I explained how compute shaders are dispatched using multiple thread groups. We can create thread groups that contain up to 1024 threads. For example, currently we are using groups of 256 threads for light culling. Each thread group has access to a block of memory with a maximum size of 32 kilobytes. We can use this space to define one or more group shared variables that can be accessed by all threads within the group. The local variables are stored in special fast memory which is called a register file. Each group has a maximum of 64 kilobytes of register space, but this could differ per manufacturer. There is often a maximum of 255 registers that can be used by a thread. However, with 1024 threads in a group, we can only use 64 registers per thread. When we use more registers, the additional memory is allocated on slower non-register memory, which will obviously impact the performance. A GPU consists of many cores that are called compute units by AMD and streaming multiprocessors by NVIDIA. Each of these units can run one or more thread groups concurrently. However, the smallest amount of work can be done on groups of 32 or 64 registers at a time. That means that each line of code operates on that many lanes. This is called a warp by NVIDIA and a waveform by AMD. In HLSL, it's called a wave. Note that a thread group with more than 32 threads will be executed in multiple, possibly concurrent waves. We can try to form a mental model of how the GPU runs this code. Remember, this is only conceptual and in reality it's much more complicated, so please feel free to read as much as you can find on this subject if graphics programming is where you'd like to specialize. Let's pretend that the compiler wouldn't optimize this code. In that case, a load instruction is executed which will load a value of 3 onto 32 or 64 lanes. The second load instruction loads the value of 5. Then a single multiply instruction multiplies the two waves using component-wise multiplication. You can see how this is very similar to SIMD operations on x86 CPUs, where SIMD stands for single instruction multiple data. Here a single multiply instruction calculates 32 or 64 values. Now let's say that we continue this code by subtracting x from z, when thread id's x value is even and subtract y from z otherwise. In this case, a subtract instruction is executed, which again calculates 32 or 64 subtractions. However, only the lanes for which the branch condition is true will be written to. This is followed by the second subtraction instruction, which again calculates the entire set of values, but only writes to the lanes where the branch condition is true. The resulting vector contains the values that you'd expect. Note how the amount of work that's done by an instruction doesn't depend on the branch. In some cases, where every lane in a wave takes the same branch, the instructions in other branches can be skipped entirely. With HLSL Shader Model 6.0 came the new wave intrinsic functions that make it possible for the threads to gain information about other threads in the same wave. Here you can read all about what these functions are and how you can use them. As we saw earlier, when the wave takes a branch, it will only modify the lanes for which the branch condition is true. These are called active lanes. We can determine if a lane is the first active lane by calling wave is first active intrinsic function. We can use this in combination with other functions to reduce the number of writes to shared memory. For example, if we wanted to get the maximum value in all active lanes and write it to a group shared variable, we could do it like this. This reduces the number of interlocked function calls by a factor of 32 or 64. In this presentation, you can read about different use cases for wave intrinsics. At a high level, we start with a list of image files which we would like to import into a texture asset. We'll read and, if necessary, decode these files in memory. 
Most file formats use some kind of encoding or compression in order to make the file size smaller. After loading the files in memory, we can either save them directly to a texture asset file in raw format or optionally encode the resulting texture in a block compressed format. These are lossy compression formats that can be decoded on the hardware while the shader is sampling the texture. The advantage of using block compression is that it uses less memory. We'll see how this works in a later video and I'll also explain those formats in a bit more detail when we are going to use them for our imported textures. If we manage to successfully load all images that we want to use for a texture asset, then we send the data over to the editor, which will save it to an asset file. So this part of the pipeline is in C++ and we are going to use the DirectX text library for reading and encoding the images. Those of you who have been following this series for some time may already know that in general we like to minimize third-party dependencies in order to maximize the learning experience and also keep the building process of this project as simple as we can. I decided to make an exception in this case because decoding and encoding various image file formats is something that could take a very long time to do correctly simply because of the sheer number of different formats and edge cases. Even if I would go down that rabbit hole, I'm not sure if I could get any benefits out of it in terms of performance or efficiency. That's why I'm going to use this library, which I think does a very decent job of providing the functionality that we are looking for. It's also open source and offers more than just the functions for image processing. Here you can see the list of various functionality that it offers. However, we are only going to use it for importing textures. Looking at the pipeline in a bit more detail, we see that a list of image files is provided in the import settings data structure along with other properties which we'd like our texture to have. For example, we could tell the importer to create an array of 2D textures or a 3D volume texture by providing the appropriate setting. Next, we read the image files, which could be in any of these file formats. Depending on the type of texture that we'd like to construct, an intermediate texture is created that contains all the data and information about the texture. Then we can optionally create a chain of mipmaps for this texture. We also have the option to encode the final texture in one of the block compressed formats. As I mentioned, we'll support 1D, 2D and 3D textures, as well as cube maps. In addition, we can create texture arrays for any texture dimension, except for 3D textures. At the end, this data is sent to the editor, which will save it to an asset file.